Welcome to Managing 3D Labs Part 2, Intellectual Property Issues, presented by Central Texas Library System, Incorporated. This video lesson is part of the 3D Labs at Your Library grant, funded by the U.S. Institute of Museum and Library Services through a grant to the Texas State Library and Archives Commission 2017. This lesson will cover copyright and patents, trademarks and trade address, the public domain, and recommend some additional resources at the end. Since I am not a lawyer, I am including the usual disclaimer here. None of this should be construed as legal advice, which can only apply to specific circumstances anyway. If you need legal advice, consult a lawyer. Let's begin with how copyright and patents are different. Copyrights protect the expressions of an idea, but not the idea itself. There must be some human creativity in the expression. A business directory, for example, is not copyrightable, but an annotated business directory like GuideStar is. Copyright is automatic. It does not have to be registered anywhere, although registration does make legal action easier. It can also be anonymous. That unmarked figurine sold at the dollar store is protected by copyright and duplicating it without permission is illegal, even though there is no realistic way to contact the copyright owner and ask for permission. Copyright also lasts an incredibly long time. If someone writes a poem and drops dead on the spot, the poem will be protected by copyright for 70 years, or about two generations. Someone who writes a poem at age 12 and lives to 100 will have a copyright for 158 years, or about five generations. A poem produced anonymously, or as a work for hire, is copyrighted for 95 years if published within 25 years, or for 120 years if not. That is about three to four generations. It's hard to make sense of just how long copyright lasts, but it is safe to say that few people will see their own generation's cultural heritage enter the public domain within their own lifetime. Because copyright casts such a vast net, it has escape clauses. Most importantly, fair use, which allows people to violate copyright in specific situations without getting punished for it. Fair use is complicated and situational. The U.S. Copyright Office has created a fair use index to help people find examples similar to their own and get a sense of how different courts have ruled on those situations. They also have a link on that page to more information about fair use that includes the four-factor test used by courts to decide whether fair use is a defense in a case they are hearing. Patents are the flip side of copyright in many ways. A utility patent protects an invented process, thing, or improvement, but not the appearance of the end result. Conversely, a design patent protects a purely ornamental component of a thing, but not any aspect of the thing's function. As an example, a utility patent on crispy French fries limits who can use that method to make french fries crispy, but cannot control anything else like what food color is added. A design patent can specify the shape and material composition of a cell phone, but not the colors applied after manufacturing or any aspect of its operation. Patents are not automatic and cannot be anonymous. They must be registered by the actual inventor even if the rights are immediately assigned to a company or a university. A utility patent, a process thing or improvement, lasts 20 years. A design patent lasts 14 years. Extensions are sometimes allowed due to administrative delays, but as a general rule, anything that is more than 20 years old can be copied without fear of patent infringement. Since patents have a shorter duration than copyrights, they also have much stronger enforcement. There are no fair use, ignorance, or other defenses. Copyright and patents really make life difficult when it comes to 3D printing. However, we need to be able to recognize and discuss the issues when we work with the public. These examples should help illustrate when and how these rights apply. Time-lapse photography illustrates what can and cannot be copyrighted. If the camera was deliberately positioned to artistically frame a scene and then set into motion, then the resulting sequence of photos is protected by copyright. On the other hand, images or recordings automatically captured by security or monitoring cameras are purely functional and not protected by copyright. 
This distinction also comes into play with animal selfies and artificial intelligence, where the courts have yet to draw the line. The U.S. Copyright Office has determined that only works of art created by humans are eligible for copyright, but there are zoos that depend on the sale of sculptures and paintings created by artistically inclined animals. There are also examples of people who have trained animals to operate cameras which invokes the trainer's artistic contribution. Animal copyright is gradually entering the judicial system, and we will hopefully have some kind of guidance within a decade or so. The stance of the U.S. Copyright Office on Artificial Intelligence combines their stance on animals and time-lapse photography. The extent of the artist's control over the AI's operation determines whether the result is copyrightable. This could be bad news for sports news, which today is largely generated by automated systems with minimal editorial oversight. AIs are also appearing in video games to create unique landscapes and background music. If people cannot claim the work of an unattended AI, then a lot of people have a lot of money to lose. Then again, companies with experimental AIs that occasionally make or spread defamatory claims most certainly do not want to own what their AIs generate. The issues surrounding AIs have yet to reach the courts, so guidance is firmly somewhere way off in the future. Curtains help illustrate the line between copyright and patent. The basic idea of a curtain has been around for a long time and is in the public domain, free for anyone to use. An artistic design printed on the fabric is copyrightable. A new and innovative material or cut that makes the curtain work in a special way is patentable. Similarly, anyone can make a rocking chair, but an artistic pattern in the fabric, a painting on the chair, a novel design, or a novel fabrication are all potentially protectable. As with time-lapse photography, this seems easy enough to apply at first, but quickly gets complicated. Among the 12 circuit courts, there are 10 methods for deciding what features are integral to an object and the subject of patents, and what features are separable decoration and the subject of copyright. Fortunately, we may have some guidance in the near future. The U.S. Supreme Court has agreed to hear Star Athletica versus Varsity Brands a case about whether the stripes and chevrons on cheerleader uniforms are integral or separable to the uniforms. This may sound trivial, but the implications are far-reaching. If the elements in question are separable, then combinations of stripes or other elements added to clothing to create a pattern are creative works. This gives fashion designers broad copyright protections against knockoff companies. For an example outside of fashion, the non-functional design of tile, its combination of shape, pattern, and texture are protectable by copyright. On the other hand, if the elements are integral, then the function of clothing as a covering has precedence. This is an awkward concept, so the Sixth Court of Appeals uses a dress as an example and explains that a creative arrangement of beads attached to a dress is not protectable because they are an attached part of the dress, which in turn serves a purely functional purpose of clothing the body. Knockoff companies will have free reign to copy designs to the extent that they can argue that the copied features serve to clothe the body. Returning to the tile example, the shape, pattern, and texture other than trademarks could be freely copied. The discussions I have read and heard have not touched on whether design patents might be available to fashion designers if copyright is not. 3D files are another complex topic. The files themselves may be handcrafted, show creativity, and be copyrighted. They may also be programmatically generated and not inherently copyrightable, but yet have copyrighted fragments embedded. Additionally, the product of the file the resulting computer image or printed model may or may not be copyrighted, patented, or both for the many reasons illustrated in the previous examples. Transformation is a possible defense against copyright violation, but is difficult to use successfully. The idea is that protected work can be incorporated into something new if the new thing is sufficiently different from the original. 
Jeff Koons, an appropriation artist, is a poster child for testing the limits of what counts as a transformative work. We have learned several things from the lawsuits filed against him. Changing the colors in an image is not enough. Reproducing a two-dimensional image in three dimensions is not enough, even if some of the colors are different. Reproducing a two-dimensional image in three dimensions, with some of the objects replaced by similar objects, is still not enough, even if some of the colors are different. But, distorting a portion of an image after changing some of the colors and then giving a caption is okay. Applying this example is reasonably easy. People often look at 3D printers and think how great it would be to make a 3D version of a favorite cartoon character, team logo, or other icon. If the owner of the image has not given fans permission to do this, then don't do it. To the fan, it feels like a show of support, but it is actually a loss of trust between the author and the audience. Replacement parts are the least complex of these examples. Repairing something that is more than 20 years old is not an issue. Any patents will have expired by this time, so creating a part that lacks any copyrightable designs is going to be okay. For that matter, reproducing the entire device will be fine. Within the 20-year period, it is more difficult. A past rule of thumb was that patents are normally for systems of parts working together, so the individual parts would be fair game, as long as the patented system as a whole is not reproduced. That may not be so true anymore. The use of 3D printing to manufacture has changed this rule of thumb. Ingenious parts that depend on 3D printing are now being designed and the traditional patent rules allow these individual parts to be protected. If something seems impossible to create without 3D printing, then it is safest to assume it is patented, unless there is a specific reason to believe otherwise. This is a good time to very briefly introduce trademarks and trade dress. Both of these things exist to protect the identity of a company or product. This protection is intended to help both the company and the customer. The customer relies on the trademark and trade dress as a sort of certification that they are getting the real thing from the real company and not a cheap knockoff by a less reputable competitor. From the company's point of view, the trademark and trade dress allow the company to protect a reputation that it has invested a lot of effort to create and maintain. The trademark certifies and protects the company's name and brand, while trade dress is the style that brand or product is known for. Because trademarks and trade dress are all about reputation, they cannot be anonymous. They need not be registered to have value, but when two companies dispute over a trademark, a company that did register it is in a much stronger position. Trademarks and trade dress never expire because they protect a reputation instead of a product. On the other hand, they can suffer from dilution. Dilution is when a trademark or trade dress loses its association with the company and its reputation. One example of dilution is the ongoing difficulty of retaining the Kleenex trademark. When people use the brand name generically to mean any brand of facial tissue, the owning company, Kimberly Clark Worldwide, loses some of their connection to the name and some of their reputation as well. They are not able to control their customer speech without committing huge invasions of privacy which in turn would hurt their reputation even more than losing their trademark might. Instead, they aggressively take legal action against any company that uses the name Kleenex to mean facial tissue generally. By forcing other companies to set a good example for the public, they certify their products and protect their reputation while limiting the negative consequences of their effort. Lastly, some attention needs to be given to the public domain. The public domain is important because it gives people unrestricted access to their own cultural heritage. The extension of copyright to span several generations means people generally have full access to the culture of their grandparents, but not their parents or their own culture. Even then, people have only unfettered access to the culture that has been preserved by continued commercial exploitation or by the diligence of their grandparents. Not everyone has been happy with the situation, so some ways to mitigate the effects of copyright have been developed. The most important of these are the permissive licenses developed by Creative Commons, Free Software Foundation, and several others.
These licensing schemes acknowledge the difficulty of actually putting something into the public domain and allow authors to very closely simulate the public domain. The public domain, permissive licensing, and general attitudes against restrictions too easily come with a lapse of respect for authorship. Most of the permissive licenses include clauses requiring proper attribution for the contributions of others. Any conversation about intellectual property should include the importance of respecting the efforts of others and giving attribution. Thank you for listening to this lesson on intellectual property. Links to the resources mentioned, as well as some additional resources, may be found in the script, which is also available. The next lesson is about managing knowledge from the perspective of adult education.